We're good. You're very welcome to our continued series of interviews with home educated adults in Ireland. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by Louis Wilde, who I think is speaking to me from Cork. Is that right, Louis? That's right indeed, yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for giving us your time. So do you want to introduce yourself and tell us uh, where you're from and what age you are and anything you think we should know about Louis? Okay, uh, so I'm 30. Uh, I'm from, well, from County Cork. I, I grew up in Enniskeen, uh, which is just about, yeah, 45 minutes from Cork City, uh, near, near Bandon, if anybody knows about that. Okay, um, so a nice rural location. A nice rural location, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, I remember talking to your dad when you were much younger and saying that you had been a small boy in England and that he just kind of thought, you know what, I don't think I want my kids to grow up in a city. Yeah, very much so. So I was born in Mossley, which is a suburb of Manchester. Okay. Uh, and I don't know whether you've ever been to Manchester, but it's huge. I and know sporting. Manchester. <laughs> there are yeah, relations yeah. there, yeah. And, and actually, I love Manchester, but obviously it's it's quite rough in places. Uh, and yeah, I think they just wanted us to be able to have a garden to play in and uh, not to have traffic going down the street and just somewhere somewhere safe and uh, a nice place to grow up. So yeah, yeah. Okay, so you went I, from kind of urban Manchester to rural Cork. So that's that's the setting. And you were quite small, I think, when you moved over. Oh yeah, small enough that I can't remember England at all. I was kind of one and a half. So uh, okay, I, I've been in Ireland all my all my life, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> okay, and so do you want to tell us what your home education looked like at the start? Were mum and dad both at home? Was one at home? Was one working? And you have one brother, so. Uh, who is uh, older than you? Am I right? Uh, younger. He's younger. Okay, I'm, so you're yeah, yeah. you're you're kingpin. Okay, so you're. you're <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. So do you want um, to tell us what it looked like? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I guess most of the time, one of my parents would be working, and the other one would be at home. Uh, and sometimes, so I was, I was really lucky when I was growing up that uh, in the local area, there was quite a lot of other homeschoolers. Uh, there was quite a lot of other people doing the same things. So on some days, both my parents would have to work, but I was able to go and me, well, me and Perry were able to go and stay with uh, friends of ours, other homeschoolers. Uh, and we do bits of education with them as well. We, we shared the education. So sometimes they'd come over uh, and my dad would teach things to them and us at the same time. And sometimes I do uh, lessons with, uh, with my friends' parents. Uh, okay, so that sounds pretty much what you're describing, like an informal kind of a co-op. So it wasn't like on Mondays, Ian is going to teach everybody history, for instance, or whatever, but it was just, it was informal and around the needs of the family. Very, yeah, very informal. And I, I guess my mum and dad's idea uh, of education when I was growing up is, is that they teach us things when we wanted to learn them. Uh, so we weren't forced to sit down at lessons at a certain time or do things against our will. Uh, well, not very often anyway. Um, <laughs> so, so it would be, so for instance, when I, uh, I didn't start, I didn't learn to read till I was about seven, uh, which in a school system, that would be quite late. Yes. Uh, but I just wasn't interested. And then at seven, I suddenly was interested and I wanted to read. And I picked it up in a couple of weeks. I went from reading nothing to reading Harry Potter uh, yeah. just very, really, really quickly because I was so interested and I was passionate and I wanted to do it. Um, uh, so yeah, a lot of my education would have been like that. I'd have shown an interest and said, oh, I want to know about this or I want to know about that. And uh, luckily my mom and dad were really great and just, uh, sharing that interest with me straight away, I suppose. Wow, so what I'm hearing is that your parents didn't have a timeline when they said um, Louis and Perry must be anything, um, learning to run by a certain age, learning to, I don't know, feed themselves with a spoon, learning to <laughs> read a book. And I, I'm saying those things because as a parent, I find it interesting that in a spread of ages, in the same family with kids, 
some mm. will be ready to climb the stairs a lot quicker than others. Um, yeah. So I think each person has their own inbuilt uh, timeline for when they're ready and that reading and maths and the things we think of as education, uh, while they are important, I'd be very sad myself. I think if I didn't know how to read or if any of my kids didn't want to read, but really when you look at what a human baby has to learn, I guess feeding yourself and um, not having toilet accidents all the time and learning to speak in the tongue that your parents speak to you in is probably actually bigger than anything else we learn in the rest of our lives. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I also, I think like, I was always going to want to learn to read. It wasn't like, it wasn't something, there was always going to be a time where I was like, I was going to be inquisitive. So it was never going to be that I was going to get to 20 without having started it. And it's the same with maths or with anything really. I was always going to want to know that information because you're a child and you're naturally inquisitive and you want to understand the world and know what's going on. So, uh, yeah, yes, that's, a good, that's a good point. And your house would have been a house where... I'm guessing both your parents read a lot to you before you could read and that they were reading books for themselves all along or have I got the household wrong in that? No, no, you're very right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually one, uh, that was one carrot when I started to read actually was uh, my dad had read us the first three Harry Potter books. Oh, uh, wow. He didn't like the fourth one and he was like, I'm not reading this to you because I don't like the way it goes. Uh, okay. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have to read this myself. Um, okay. Uh, That's really interesting because I think a lot of people think that um, parenting children is hard work. And yes, it is. But they think that it has to be uncomfortable and un, um, unenjoyable. And the fact that your dad liked the first three Harry Potters and then got to the point where he honored his own dislike of the way the book was turning um, yeah I think that's and, and that it didn't hold you back but he didn't take it to the next level which was to say to you and your brother I forbid you to read number four and then making that something that was yeah. going to be oh my god what's in Harry Potter number four we got to get that book <laughs> you know? yeah 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 exactly uh, yeah no my dad always is always saying how much he loved the whole experience and it was a journey for him just as much as it was a journey for us and, so, and my mum as well. Uh, uh, and sometimes I suppose that meant that to teach us something they needed to, I'm guessing now, uh, but they needed to learn it themselves, I suppose. Uh, so it was probably educational for them as well as it was for us. Okay, so uh, when you say they had to learn something for themselves in order to communicate it to you, do you mean you or your brother at some point decided you were interested in something that they had no knowledge of and they went and found the information for you or? I, I suspect that was the case. I'm, I, I can't think of an exact example. But That's okay. I imagine, I imagine like I, I do remember uh, I got these comics when I was a kid, which were Where's Wally history comics. Uh, okay. And what they'd be is each, each week was a, a featured a certain time in history. So it might uh, feature ancient Egypt or something like that. Uh, and I can very much imagine that I'd read this comic and be interested in ancient Egypt, but maybe my mum or dad wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't know a great deal about ancient Egypt. So they'd maybe have to look it up to tell me more about it. That, that's, uh, I'm hypothesizing here a little bit, but okay. I, I that nobody's that. nobody's going to come back and 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 fact check us um <laughs> so, yeah. and and um newsflash my follow-up series is i have to track down uh and on camera track down all these parents of all these amazing young people because you know that's an interesting and inspiring story of itself and i think Definitely, knowing families yeah. where people have had one idea about education as in well Education is good. I guess that's something we all agree on, really. But maybe education yeah. doesn't always equal school for some families. Yeah, yeah. And then to take that and to um, see how parents, particularly if they had uh, kids over a span of ages, and how their own attitude of how to impart knowledge to the next generation might have developed, I think that's, yeah. I don't see myself retiring anytime soon. <laughs> 
this. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that would be brilliant because I, I definitely, everyone I spoke, I've spoken to who's been home educated has had a different experience of how their parents has approached it and how, they, how they've learned. So it's terribly individual. Each person, person's learning path is what I'm hearing from you. So yes, you know, yes, definitely. So um, I believe word on the street is that you're quite the soccer player and have quite a bit of interest in cricket. Yes. Yeah, well, so yeah, I was, uh, I was talking about this to someone recently, actually. So uh, the first thing I wanted to be when I was a little tiny kid was a detective. Uh, so when I was five or six, I was just wanted to be Sherlock Holmes. And maybe when I realized that it wasn't quite as glamorous as Sherlock Holmes, uh, I had moved on. The next thing I was definitely wanted to be was a footballer. Uh, so I was crazy into football uh, all through my youth. And to be honest, I, I still am. Uh, I still play uh, as many times a week as I can uh, and watch all the games as well. Um, and yeah, and that was a thing I did as a child a lot with my friends as well. Uh, we'd get together, have big football matches. And I, I remember that's one of my strongest memories of the conferences, the home education conferences, is the ever going three, four hour games of football we used to have. Uh, Absolutely. Which I think remember when I was there, it was generally me pushing them on to make them that long. <laughs> Just a little bit longer. It was your fault we couldn't get kids in off the pitch to eat a dinner then. I re because yes. I always yes. characterise the early days of the home ed um, conferences. So I guess I'm talking from maybe the noughties, maybe. Yeah. My memory yeah. of those conferences is like a soccer match that seemed to start on the Thursday or Friday evening when people got together and parents would have the tents disassembled and stuff packed in the car and would still be trying to pull soccer players <laughs> off the pitch to get them loaded up for home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was my idea of heaven, so... Uh, I, I think I think one hour I do I do remember one day it was like we actually had like an eight hour game um, with maybe a little stop in between for oh, wow. um, but yeah yeah it wasn't always as long as that but yeah that well, was certainly something stamina was very... involved and <laughs> yeah, yeah and and, and you know and that gives the lie to the assumption that people have that unless you keep people's noses to some kind of a grindstone, they'll never actually see anything through. And I guess that's one of the assumptions I'm really happy that people are putting to bed, you know, that unless there's either a reward or a punishment, that people won't actually learn anything useful. Yeah, so no, no, there's, you definitely, I guess I was saying before, a child's uh, inquisitive nature and a child wants to learn anyway. Uh, Okay. that's yeah it's built in uh and adults i'm still learning, learning. every day now and yeah uh, learning all the time i think is probably what we could be saying about ourselves but do you want to talk then a bit about um as a teenager did you ever think you'd like to go to school did you ever go to school did you ever think the leaving cert or junior cert exams were something that you should actually have a go at did you i don't think i did i certainly so i never i never went to a school my uh first education experience was a uh, uh, VTEC college. Okay. I don't remember ever having a burning desire. I, I was, I, I was, I still am. And I was as a teenager, I was just really happy with what I was doing and where I was. And okay. uh, yeah, so I, yeah, no, I don't think I ever, I ever felt the need to, but my parents did always give me that choice i remember multiple occasions when they said hey if you want to go to school we'll 100 percent support that and that's 100 percent fine and they they did say that and they did give that me that opportunity okay on quite a lot of occasions regularly in fact so i was never forced to be home educated uh, it was my it was always my choice uh, we're, we're back to your dad and the fourth harry potter and it didn't suit him but like maybe something else might suit you yeah so yeah, that's, that's yeah a, exactly, exactly. Family theme about um, persuasion and gentleness rather than coercion. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. And so, what did you study as a, a VTAC course? Um, so, as VTAC, I, I did uh, art. So, I did painting and sculpture because uh, that was something I was interested in as a child. And also, something I think that a lot of my peers 
were interested in were doing. I was surrounded by quite a lot of artistic people, I suppose. Okay. Um, and particularly at the time, so if my first career choice had been a detective and then I wanted to be a footballer, sometime in my teenage years, I discovered photography and cameras. Uh, and I was doing out, I did a uh, project when I was 17 or 18, I think, where I decided I was going to take a photograph every day. Uh, so I did a photograph every day for a year. Uh, so part of doing the arts degree, part of it was, well, the arts, VTAC, sorry, was that part of it was photography. So that was the bit that interested, interested me most. Um, and do you want to talk a bit about music and how you got into that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think we started, we started quite late. Um, my dad did like, and I guess that was another thing when I was a child is my mum and dad did uh, let me have a go at a lot of different things to see which ones I might be interested in. So uh, one of the things I had a go at was my dad taught me a little bit of guitar and a little bit of piano. And I used to play kind of classical songs on the piano. Um, but I don't remember doing absolutely loads of that as a child. And it wasn't till I think I was about 15 or 16. And it was Ben and Tom, Tom Duffy uh, and my brother Perry. And they were they did a s summer school called Fuse. And I did the school as well, but I, I did it. Uh, I did it as an artist, but they all did it as musicians. Uh, and they formed a band in the summer school. Uh, which was Perry on guitar, Ben singing, and Tom on drums. Uh, but they didn't have a bass player. Um, so I think one thing led to another, and there was a bass in the house, and I picked up the bass and started started playing with them. And it kind of went from there, really. And ever since then, music has always been a part of what I've done. And we've, we've done loads of gigs as wild. We've done... Uh, uh, albums we're currently working on our kind of second studio album now which is just being mixed um and we we did a studio album before that as well um so yeah it's always been a big part of my life um so you're on your second album and is that a collaboration just with your brother or what's the band called or what's the band made up of? who's in the band oh yeah so the band's called wild and actually so this album's really nice because it's really collaborative so uh, me and Perry play and sting on everything, um, but there's other uh, loads and loads of other people. So Ben Duffy plays drums on it, but also uh, several drummers uh, from the degree course I'm doing um, play on it on different tracks. There's different keyboard players playing on different tracks. Okay. Uh, there's guest singers singing on it there's I, I yeah there's loads of people I have, I have if I had a whole list of names in front of me it would be quite long so yeah that's really nice so there's going to be a long list at the end of this album of credits and who to thank yeah yeah exactly exactly that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so you're uh, still it's lovely. a degree at the moment yes yeah um so I just finished my third year um so I'm coming into my final year now and it's a, a degree in popular music uh, and it's in CIT, the School of Music in Cork. Um, so that's kind of more commonly known for they have a classical music degree. They've had a classical music degree for 50, 60 years. I think I think it's been there a long, long time. Um, but they introduced a popular music degree about seven or eight years ago. Um, okay. And yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. It's a really, it's a really great thing. I'm delighted that I decided to do it because um, I. Yeah. That college is actually incredible because um, my one of mine, Aaron, is, is attending there, has just finished second year. Yes, of course, of course. Of, of the classical music degree. But when we went for the open day and I was reading some of the information, apparently, if you can still call anywhere the British Isles, um, that is the oldest college of music in England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And oh, really? I didn't do that. Apparently, now I, I don't want to correct what you're saying about a degree because I don't know when they started offering degrees, but apparently in the 18, late 18, 80s or 90s, the Guildhall in London wrote to the people in Cork saying, how do we set up a music school? Wow. Fun fact. And it may not wow. be true. You can fact check me and let me know if, <laughs> if I'm wrong about <laughs> that. But certainly... No, that 
CSM were confident enough with the Cork School of Music were confident enough to put that on something in writing and hand it out to prospective parents of prospective students. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, no, I'm so actually what I was saying about the degree is that the degree in pop music is new, but they've been giving degree to, yeah. yeah, the classical degree. Uh, and that's where you're finding a lot of people to collaborate with then, I'm guessing. Yes, yeah, exactly. There's so many talented people there. Um, yeah, so you're enjoying that and you found a course that you like and you started it as a mature student, so therefore you didn't, you would have been 20, 27 starting that course? 20, yeah, 27, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so therefore you didn't need a leaving cert and you, I'm assuming, got in by audition? I did get in by audition, actually. So I did the FETAC, when I did the FETAC, the FETAC would have actually been enough for me to get onto the course anyway. And I did... I actually, after I did the FETEC, I applied to some universities uh, and I got into a, the Falmouth Fam University in the UK, uh, just on my FETEC qualification. Uh, did you, sorry, did you say Falmouth? Falmouth, yeah, yeah, Falmouth. yeah. Okay, so down, I'm saying South, Southwest, Cornwall, yeah. kind of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right, right at the bottom, actually. It's right, okay. right in the heart of Cornwall, so yeah, yeah, very... Uh, right at the bottom of the country yeah and uh, they were happy just with my fee tech qualification and I had a good portfolio of work that I built up over the years and in the end I decided not to do that because it seemed too far away from all my friends and my family and also at that time I wasn't sure whether I wanted to make photography my full career I was more interested in the music I was doing other things so uh, I decided against it but I suppose what I'm saying is the fee tech was on its own enough uh, Which is really important for parents watching this to know that if getting a degree is going to be important to your child or if when you are making this decision about a four or five year old today saying, do I send them to school in September or not? And I think the yeah. fear that's in a lot of parents' minds is if I don't put them through the conventional system for 13 years, then they'll come out one hating me because two I will have prevented them getting to where they want to go yeah yeah so no that's they don't need to worry <laughs> <laughs> and so have you had various um t employment opportunities over the years besides I mean let's be honest people get terrified when their child says that they want to be an artist or a musician because they think not everybody can be um you know, a highly paid musician or artist. In fact, if you're yeah. an artist, you're not going to be really well paid till you're dead, basically. So it's your grandchildren, if they find your paintings, are going to benefit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, no, so I, I, yeah, I'm kind of aware as an artist, well, I'm aware that there's, there's, there's opportunities actually for uh, probably I like becoming a teacher, for instance, would be a way where I would have quite a healthy income. And that is, both my parents are teachers, so that's something I might do. And that was one of the reasons for thinking I might get a degree, actually, was going into, going into teaching. Okay, so down the line. if money um, for your own uh, creative projects wasn't enough to put bread on the table, you would have the classic Irish parent thing, something to fall back on of a degree that would <laughs> allow you to be paid a wage as a teacher in a state school, more or less. Exactly that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, actually, so going into employment before that, um, I worked for quite a, many years, actually, for an uh, arts company in Cork called Doucher. Oh, yeah. um, and they did, so I started with them um, uh, as an elf. I, I, it was Christmas time and they, they needed, they needed, they were looking for actors uh, and, uh, so I auditioned and uh, got this the job as an elf. So I was an elf for Christmas. And just from chatting to them and uh, hanging out with them during, during being an elf, uh, they said, did I want to come and uh, have a go uh, working on the next project? Uh, so I started as a kind of voluntary. I did two weeks of just volunteering with them. And after that, uh, they offered me a job. Um, and but basically they're their biggest job of the year would be St. Patrick's Day because they get commissioned to do the floats for Dublin and for Cork. Uh, so that first job with them was helping them build build floats basically for the Patrick's Day parades in Cork. 
So it's a very artistic thing to do. Um, but from that, they got this idea that I was quite well organized uh, and was good at talking to people. Um, <laughs> um, oh, social skills and you never went to school. I know. <laughs> So they gave me then a job as uh, administrator. Um, so I became administrator and the production production manager then further down the line. Um, so I worked as them for four years, I think four or five years, and as as an administrator and as production manager, um, kind of organising the big parades, uh, organising all, all the volunteers because for each parade we needed maybe two hundred people in costumes, so they needed someone to. Uh, a find 200 people somewhere who were happy to put on silly costumes and walk through the city and b make sure they were all in the right place at the right time and made it to rehearsals and were well fed and had a good time of it and so yeah i was doing all that kinds of stuff um, you actually had to and that coordinate was really your... enjoyable because you yeah, yeah yeah no yeah so i was co coordinating yeah i was coordinating everything that was going on and 200 uh, people making sure yeah 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 well it was in fact i think it was possibly even more than that because there was the two phrase there was cork and and dublin going on at once so i was kind of sending teams to do the cork one and i was going up to dublin to uh coordinate that one so yeah it, it was great fun it was a little bit stressful at times obviously but uh yeah i really enjoyed it um, and do you remember never knew what like age you, you were, sorry, Louis, to oh, interrupt yeah. you. Do you remember what age you were when A, you became the elf and then B, you were production manager and managing 200 people plus? So I'd have been 22, 23 when I was the elf. One of those two. I think I was 22, just about to turn 23, actually. Okay. Um, and then it would have been the year later that I, I was starting to so from the age of 24, you were managing quite a large number of people and presumably a budget and things like that as well. Yes. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, and tr also just making sure that uh, we delivered the builds on time as well, That because uh, we'd have people from the from the St. Patrick's Festival coming down to make sure we were on schedule. So I, I had to try and make sure we were following some kind of production schedule through it uh that everything was happening in the right order um and yeah it was great, great fun because you'd arrive in the workshop and you could arrive in it one day and there'd just be like a giant jet dragon had appeared overnight or something that the wow. lads had made or so yeah it was a very um and i guess i got offered another job as an arts administrator uh, would have it was a slightly bigger job uh it would have been paid me more and it was this was when I was about 26 and it was then I suddenly realized that if I took this job and followed it I could become a production manager and an arts administrator for the rest of my life and that was going to be my path and so that's why I kind of stopped and had a big think about it and I was like actually what I'd really like to do is do music play music be a composer be a teacher of music so that was when I decided I, I'd stop doing the arts administration and take on a degree in music instead. Uh, so if I'm hearing you right and understanding what you're telling us, it means that it was a lucrative job offer made you sit back and think, actually, I want to go to college. You yes. know, and that's <laughs> yeah. very, so for people from a conventional educational path, it's that you, as I see it, and this is going to sound a little bit judgy, um, you kind of mortgage somebody's childhood from the age of four in, or three in my day, and now it's kind of like from eight, nine, 11 months, children are in some kind of an institution generally. And then yeah. you're there till you're 18, 19, and then you're doing a four year, three, four year degree, seven year degree, if you're doing medicine or, or physio or dentistry or whatever, along mm -hmm. with your internship. And then you're gonna get your job that's gonna mean that all the sacrifice of your childhood is gonna be worth it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's quite profound. And I, what's really striking me as well is that you had to manage a lot of human beings and a lot of, and a big budget and you had responsibilities to people who were volunteering or employed and people who were funding. And 
even though it sounds to me like your childhood routine might have involved okay always being at a soccer game at a certain time so you're able to manage that but you didn't have your life wasn't timetabled from the age of four or five to the age of 18 no. from nine to three or four and yet, no, yes. and yet you have been able, because people's fear, our assumption as adults and parents is that if we don't make our children knuckle down to stuff that's unpleasant, that they'll never do it. Yeah. Well, and that's just not the case at all. <laughs> but it also uh, sounds like, crucially, you've been able to earn money in things that gave you pleasure. You enjoyed going in and seeing what the float builders had come up with since you'd seen it the last time. So your yeah, job, it yeah. appears to me, was something that gave you joy and it, still and actually, meant you were able to pay rent and, and, and buy food and, and new guitar strings. Very much so, yeah. And actually, funnily enough, that side of it was really enjoyable, but actually I really enjoyed the organisational side of it as well. There's something really uh, nice about uh, a big day. So the the first, the first Paddy's Pat St. Patrick's Day I did where everything ran. Just lost you there for a second. You're 